All right, welcome everyone. My name is Emily Bell and I'm the communication coordinator for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Restoring Critical Habitat for Wildflowers and Wildlife in Florida's Panhandle. For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily through sales and renewals of the Florida State Wildflower License Plates. These funds, along with donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. You can see our old plate here and our lovely redesign that's been on the road for a while now here. Um, We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. And if you purchase or have the wildflower plate, you're eligible for a membership. So just let us know if you have the tag and we'll get you set up in the database. Be sure to check out our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom for our upcoming events and more. We're also on social media and you can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. We have a great lineup of webinars uh, starting off this year. Next month, our webinar will be Wildflowers and Weeds, Exploring What Native Means, presented by University of Florida Herbarium Extension botanist, Mark Frank, on Wednesday, February 21st at 2 p.m. And this webinar will cover the best resources for confirming if a particular species is native to your area and what types of information botanists use to determine if a species is native. We also have some great field trips in the works for this year. Um, and coming up this Saturday, we'll be at Catfish Creek Preserve State Park with the Florida Native Plant Society, exploring the ecology of the scrub and the many endemic plants that are only found in this rare environment. So we're looking forward to that and hope you can join us. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are muted with cameras off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. The chat is active, but we are not monitoring it for questions. Um, you really need to use the Q&A area and we'll address questions at the end of the talk. If your question isn't answered, you can reach out to us at info at wildflowers.org. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube channel in 24 to 48 hours. And when it's available, you will receive an email um, with a link to the recording, along with some resources from this webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Ryan Means is the president of the Coastal Plains Institute. He holds a BS in zoology and an MS in wildlife ecology and conservation, both from the University of Florida. Ryan's professional interests have always been within the longleaf pine ecosystem, notably working to save imperiled amphibians and plants and guiding human beings into this rich environment for education and rejuvenation. And we are very excited to hand this over to Ryan to learn about their programs. Well, hello everyone. It is a distinctive pleasure to be here today. I sure do appreciate this opportunity. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for that intro. It is my pleasure to be here. And my name is Ryan Means. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about a wonderful place that it is my, uh, I guess, distinctive privilege as the leader of the nonprofit organization who owns this place to get this opportunity in life to make the decisions that guide its biodiversity management. As a matter of fact, the, the mission of the Coastal Plains Institute, our nonprofit organization, is just that. It is preserving biodiversity of the Southeast Coastal Plain through scientific research, education, and in this case, which is the topic of this presentation, land stewardship. We have two ecological preserves, this being one of them. This one's my favorite one. Um, <clears throat> so without any further ado, let's get into, into our presentation. What I'd like to talk to you about today is, is sharing with you 
the past 31 years of management history that has gone on out on our Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve, <clears throat> I really want to impress upon you what the place looked like 31 years ago before I, I show you stepwise how we got to where we're at now. And so we'll talk about the step-by-step -step process of our management out there. Um, we'll def I'll define for you what exactly is our target? What, what is our management goal? What do we hope to achieve out there with what we're doing? There's some challenges too that need to be made clear for, for you know, anyone interested in land management or biodiversity management. And also, how do we know whether or not we're doing a good job? And so there are a variety of success metrics that we have, have uh, created to, to figure out whether or not we are being successful with what we're doing. And along the way in this presentation, I'll have embedded for you an ecological description of what our preserve really is and, and uh, <clears throat> what kind of habitats are out there. We'll talk about the current things that we got going on and all of the different ways that we use this property to uh, accomplish our mission. In fact, this property has really become like a platform for us to do science, to do education, and to, to manage. With us at the helm out there, y'all, I can pretty much guarantee you that this, this 80 acres of planet Earth has a fantastic conservation future ahead of it, as long as myself and the other people that I work with are working here. <clears throat> and I'd like to just mention our director who also derives her paycheck from this platform. Her name is Rebecca Means, and I hope she's here with us today. <clears throat> and uh, I'll also talk to you about the future, where we want to go with this property. So let's Let's pull out our trusty old school Apalachicola National Forest map from our back pocket and let me show you exactly where the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve is. You can see at the tip end of the blue arrow in the southwest corner of this lovely national forest is, is a couple of small polygons. Ours is a north-south rectangle. The tip of the arrow is just covering it. So this gives you an idea. This property is totally surrounded within a mesic flatwoods lonely pine ecosystem with um with with lots of open areas called wet flat or savanna bogs, um, giant open areas where there are carniv carnivorous plants and, and and oceans of herbaceous vegetation. We have some of the habitat on our property too. But this is Bogville out there in the Apalachicola National Forest. And we are the lucky owners of an 80 acre patch of land entirely in held within this forest. So back in the fall of 1993, this land was purchased by the Coastal Plains Institute under guidance from our founder, as well as the first president, Bruce Means, who is my father. And I hope President Bruce Means is here with us today too. That would be awesome. <clears throat> Dad had been looking for properties to acquire for the Coastal Plains Institute for years uh, leading up to the purchase of this land. And uh, Dad worked very closely with one of our early board members. Her name is Eleanor or Ellie Whitney. And uh, Ellie graciously came up with the money out of her own pocket, I believe, to purchase this land for the Coastal Plains Institute. And I believe if I remember correctly, our 80 acres, we paid just $60,000 for it back in 90, 1993. Thank you so much to Ellie and dad for that vision um, and for you know providing CPI with an amazing piece of land to love on and learn from moving forward. <clears throat> well, y'all, it wasn't always a fantastic amazing looking Shangri-La of wildflowers and longleaf pine ecology. This is what it looked like back in fall of 1993. It literally was a thicket of Thai Thai, Galberry, Palmetto, 
woody stem plants in the mid and understory, almost no herbaceous vegetation whatsoever. It was too shady, too shaded out, outcompeted by the broad leafed woody stemmed plants. And there was an overstory dense forest of planted young slash pines. The young slash pines were about 10 years old in, in 1993. Literally on most of this property, you, you could, you could <laughs> take a bushwhacky hike, stick your hand out in front of your face and almost not see it on most of this property. I absolutely remember those days. <clears throat> well, would you believe that this is what it looks like now, 31 years later? This is very near where that photograph was, mind you. And this is one of our seepage slope habitats. Very, very open. Um, you know, their seepage slope is laden with moisture and depauperate acidic soils. So it kind of precludes the growth of woody vegetation. Uh, that in coupling with extremely frequent growing season fires um, um, keeps the woody stem stuff out. And uh, however, if you lack fire for decades, it certainly can come in. And this scene was a thicket 30 years ago. So if we travel upslope of our seepage slopes now here in around 2023, this shot is about six months or so old now. Um, <clears throat> This is what the majority of habitat is like on the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve. This is a mostly mesic, but almost a zeriki. There are little, little areas of remnant high sand hill, if you will, like, you know, six inches to a foot tall. That's a hill in Florida, y'all. <clears throat> and it, it can have distinctive consequences for the vegetation. There is the occasional um, blue jack or turkey oak on this property, but primarily it is a mesic flatwoods with seepage slopes and even one um, wet flat savanna bog on the northwest corner. Of it. And uh, the structure of it today, you can see the slash pines are a lot larger in the in the overstory, those that remain, that is, but in understory, midstory now, we have young Longleaf pines coming up, those were planted. I'm gonna tell you that story here momentarily, but um, yeah, we are we are transitioning out the remaining slash pine and making way for a longleaf pine uh, um, canopy as time goes by. So how in the world did we get to Shangri-La after it was a 31 years ago? Well, the most important tool for doing that is fire. And this is a photograph that I took of my pop, dad, and my stepmother, Kathy. Very shortly after we purchased the property, we went out. Dad was, oh, Lord, he's a pyromaniac, man. I love it. It runs in the family, mind you. Um, he could not help himself. He had to drop a match and just see uh, how it would act. He called it a pest fire. No, this is. To, <laughs> wanting to play with fire and boy is he good at it um i could go off topic and, and tell you about you know all kinds of my father's amazing conservation and scientific history here but he is one of the one of the you know most accomplished ecological and conservation um scientists in the state and he has worked immensely with fire not only does he love to play with it but he has studied it and uh, he has, he was the first manager of the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve. It is now my honor, but I learned so much from Dad. And uh, I can never pass up an opportunity to be on one of his test fires. And so after a test and playing around and itching to burn a damn place down <laughs> and apply fire to a badly fire suppressed former Longleaf Pine ecosystem, a few months after purchase, we were able to apply our first control burn. And you know what? We had to do it in the wintertime because we had so much hazardous fuel buildup. And we really did need to choose a cooler time of year and a time when the smoke could be managed and the flame wouldn't be so hot and be so potentially liable to jump 
jump over into the national forest around us. But I can tell you this, this was the only winter burn that we ever did because winter burns are not ecological burns. They do not foster biodiversity if used in perpetuity. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. This is what it looked like immediately after that burn. And so, uh, you know, it, it took several burns over the years to open up the canopy, or excuse me, to open up the under and mid story and begin a campaign of cropping back and, and removing out all of that thick woody brush vegetation, um, the tai tai, the gallberry, the saw palmetto. <clears throat> And shortly after that first burn, in the next few years, we began thinning out, okay, every second and third row of our densely planted slash pines. And so those first fires, then coupled shortly thereafter, a thinning of the slash pines really, I mean, obviously opened up the place, allowed sunlight to penetrate and start to blanket um, the ground, so sunlight increase coupled with with frequent fire return, you know, after a long period of fire suppression, began to foster our herbaceous ground cover. And so we left 33% of our original um, slash pines. We needed to because the ground was so lacking in, in uh, herbaceous vegetation or any vegetation at all, honestly, other than just leaf litter, it was lacking in enough fuel to be able to carry our fires. And so uh, the management idea here was to leave just enough pines such that their needle drop would provide a substrate to carry fires through in, in the ensuing years. Um, <clears throat> Had we taken out all of the slash pines, we would have had a, a much more difficult time carrying fires across the landscape. So we left just enough, but took out plenty in order to open up the canopy drastically uh, so that both fire and an increase in sunlight could begin to replenish and favor the return of herbaceous plants on this property. So, <clears throat> all right, since that first burn and since the thinning of slash pines, we have very, very strictly, and this is very important, this is all like the bread and butter of my presentation here. We have applied fire every one or two or three years, kind of randomly, y'all. We can't, you know, there's, there's challenges, but there's also, you know, Mother Nature did not apply fire perfectly at, uh, you know, on X day, exactly two years later. She was rather random, but what wasn't random is this. <clears throat> Let me define for you what the natural historical fire regime of southeastern longleaf pine or pine savannas is. In a body of scientific literature, pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty clearly supports what I'm about to tell you, and it's this. The natural historical fire regime of southeastern pine savannas is a frequently returning fire interval of about two to three years on average, okay, for all, all 80 million acres of the of upland coastal plain that used to burn, okay, from Virginia down to Florida, all the way out to Texas, mind you, along the coastal plain, used to burn every two or three years, and equally as important, it, it, um, those fires occurred in late spring or early summer, and that is right around the May and June time period, okay? The vast majority of fires return frequently, but also in those two months, very important. And this has occurred for millions of years, all the way since the late tertiary, like you know, the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene. We're talking two, three, 
million years worth of evidence that suggests frequently returning fires in that late spring, early summer time frame when temperatures were hot, the first lightning strikes went pop and gigantic million plus acre fires used to, used to, I won't say rage across the landscape, but really they, they gently um, traveled for weeks sometimes. They covered vast areas and there were no impediments during those times, right? No roads, no cities, no agriculture fields, no humans to stop those fires. And so the Lonely Pineapple system is adapted to that. And its highest level of biodiversity is reached under that kind of fire regime. And so having defined what that is, the Coastal Plains Institute has applied fire since that first winter burn in a way that closely, very closely mimics the natural historical fire regime of southeastern pine savannas. Much of that research was done by my father and, and a lot of his scientific collaborators in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, Tall Timbers Research Station was a, was a humongous platform for, for that, that early science on southeastern fire regimes. So, uh, okay, yeah, it's good stuff. I tell you what, y'all, burning is fun, and we use our property as a platform for prescribed burning education. <laughs> yeah, we're not always conventional. Uh, sometimes we have a drip torch in one hand and a beer in another, or a coke, or a water, or or whatever your preference is. We we're not always loaded with the latest PPE, but. We get the job done, and, and that is something you know, I'm not always a serious human being. I like to laugh and joke and play and smile, but what I'm very serious about is my job at the Coastal Plains Institute, which is to protect the best ability that I can the biodiversity of the Southeast Coastal Plain, especially the preserve that is under my care. And so we get the burns done, and we have a damn great time doing it <clears throat> can't wait for the next one yeah when's it gonna be oh man i gotta wait a year and a half <laughs> and so some more of the management that we've done to to um restore our preserve additional to our burn regime that mimics the natural burn regime is we have planted, okay, we have planted thousands of sapling longleaf pines out there back in 2007. After we had thinned and done a few burns uh, from 93 to 2007, we thought it would be time now to plant thousands of young longleaf pines underneath those uh, rapidly now growing slash pines that were left behind. Turns out, now, about 15, 16 years later, many of those pines still exist, but they've been in a low state. They've been in the grass stage uh, for almost 15 years. And that's something that we, we learned, honestly. We believe that they're in, they've been in competition with the remaining slash pines and their journey upward, skyward, has been retarded by competition from the remaining slash pines. Nonetheless, they're present, they are growing. And in fact, Hurricane Michael was an event that opened up our canopy even more. And in the photo here on the left, you can see that, you know, we, we have plenty of longleaf pines still coming up. Part of our property though is depauperate a longleaf pine. Who knows, I'm kind of thinking about removing the remaining large slash pines and just, just going ahead and getting rid of them rapidly and give these young longleaf pines every you know every advantage that we can but honestly uh, longleaf pine will take over this property okay it is it is it is part of the ecology of longleaf pine very interestingly longleaf pine is the only species of pine in southeastern pine savannas that can survive and do survive and outcompete over the long haul in the presence of the natural historical fire regime, which is frequent fire returning in May or June time period. 
If you have infrequent fires, then slash pines, even loblolly pines, other species can move in and outcompete longleaf pine. But but longleaf pine, and you can see on the, in the photograph here on the right where my cursor is, longleaf pine can survive and often survives even at the sapling stage a fire. Okay, and you can see this individual absolutely survived. Its physical structure allows it to um, uh, escape the highest amount of heat from the fire, if you will. We call it the grass stage when it's young because it literally looks like a clump, a tuft of grass. And the needles are extremely long. They are the longest, aptly named, of any pine species in the southeast. But those needles protect it from a fire moving across it. The needles will burn mostly but by the time the needles burn down close to the apical meristem, you have this capsule of high humidity and high and low oxygen. And low oxygen in the other conditions tends to put that fire out before it bakes the apical meristem. It's really interesting physical um, adaptation of longleaf pine to survive fire at a young stage. No other pine species will do this at a sapling or young grass stage. Um, that is why longleaf pine is favored under a frequent fire regime. Again, if you wait too long between fires, then uh, pines like slash pine that can volunteer in will have shot up tall enough to protect its apical meristem and its, its growing tissues from a fire and therefore it can begin to colonize um, our pine savannas. Anyway, slash pine belongs, at, or I should say, it is favored, it's adaptations, its natural history favors it growing around the edges of wetlands. It's a wet tolerant species. Well, only pine is too, honestly. It's not called Pinus palustris for nothing, right? Naturalists who recognize the species all recognize that it absolutely can grow in moist soils. You're looking at a mesic soil type here on the left. And so, <clears throat> okay, what is our management goal? What, what are we trying to do out here? And so, <clears throat> it's, it's to restore a highly biodiverse longleaf pine ecosystem because we know from, from evidence, okay, from both science and aerial photography that this region where our preserve was, our preserve itself, used to be a longleaf pine ecosystem, a savanna, and it used to have a, a natural fire regime that I described to you earlier. And so we want very simply to return it back to that. And, uh, you know, under the correct ecological fire regime, that will happen on its own because all these plants are adapted to frequent fires. They're adapted to the natural historical fire regime, but not to any other fire regime. Things will happen successionally. Biodiversity will decline if we do not mimic the natural historical fire regime out here. Those of you who know me and have been out in the field with me have heard me rant about this time and time again. It's something I'm pretty passionate about. My father instilled this in me with his research, uh, but also his own ranting. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I've come to really understand um, that applying historical or what we call ecological burns, I may not have de defined that term for you well enough. Let's do that right now. An ecological burn is is a term given toward a kind of prescribed burning that mimics the native ecology, right? The natural, historical, ecological kind of burning that occurred out there before humans started tampering with it. And so that's what we're trying to do out here. <clears throat> how, are we, how do we know if we're gonna be successful or not? We've got at least four success metrics. Um, one of them being the presence of rare listed imperiled species, okay? Uh, remember, it was a thicket out there so uh, 30 years ago. So seeing the return of rarities is a real big thumb, thumb up and a metric for our success. 
We eventually want longleaf pine to dominate the savanna. Okay, that, that is going to happen. We're either going to fast track that or, or let it happen naturally in the presence of an ecological burn regime. We, of course, want high overall biodiversity. And um, we want there to be an open savanna structure of the forest type with a, a dense and highly diverse, primarily herbaceous ground cover, not a woody stem thicket that you can't see your hand in front of your face in. And so have we reached those success metrics? Well, let's, let's start by checking out a bunch of our list of species. Everyone, we have now recorded 20 state or federally listed plant species on this property. Keep in mind, we didn't know of a single one of them in 1993. And so in the presence of our management, these things have either, you know, uh, volunteered back onto the property from the surrounding Apalachicola National Forest, or they were present in the seed bank uh, waiting in the wings uh, to be, you know, to be liberated by fire in the future, regardless. They're back, they're coming back. Here's one of them. This is Pfizer Stegia Godfrey. I love this one. Godfrey's false dragon head. I'm gonna go a little quicker through several more. I won't, I don't have all 20 of them for you, but um, oh my goodness. This one has really exploded onto the scene in the past two or three years. I never remember it this dense, but just this past summer, Phoebanthus tenuifolius, a beautiful um. Uh, you know, rare and I believe almost endemic to the panhandle aster is now very abundantly present. Verbacena chapmanii, this is Chapman's crown beard. This not only is state listed, but it is endemic to just a handful of counties in the central panhandle. Oh, the species endemism out here in this part of the panhandle is fantastic. And we have several of the rare endemics on the Apalachicola lowlands preserve. Here's another one that just popped up, I should say, or we just observed in the past two years. This is Lillian Kate's B.I., the beautiful, the incomparable pine lily. This one is on, on the cover of one of our fine Florida wildflower books <clears throat> that I have and trust to know and love. Cynthia trichum chapmanii is hyper abundant in our, in our seepage slopes in our wet flat savanna bog area. This also is a panhandle endemic aster. And oh, the orchids, oh boy, the orchids. So how about coastal plain rosebud orchid, which mind you, we just observed that in the past year. Um, Clystesiopsis or camporum. Pogonia ophioglossoides, this is, um, this one is, what's it called? The common name for it. Think of it in a minute. Some people think these should be in the same genus. They look very similar, but they're both just hyper abundant now on our preserve. They're, they're state listed. We're so proud to have them. And leading into how biodiverse our property is, we have all four members of the Calipogon grass pink orchid genus present on the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve. Wow, just 80 acres. We got all four Calipogons. We are stoked about that. The one that is state listed and, and, and considered the rarest is Calipogon multiflorus here all the way on the right. That one is highly responsive to burning. It's known to pop up uh, about two to three weeks after, after a burn. <clears throat> We have Platanthra, the genus, just found this one in the past two years, as a matter of fact. This one's Chapman's Fringed Orchid. Love this one. We also have the uber rare endemic um, Hymenocallus henryi, or a glossifolia. This one, God, good Lord, I think this is only a one county variety of Hymenocallus, and it only occurs in Liberty County, mind you, which is where our preserve is. <clears throat> This one has green teeples, as you can see in the photograph there. Most other hymenocallus, well, all other ones in this one's range has white colored teeples. And moving on with the carnivorous plants, oh goodness gracious, the pinguiculas are just hyper abundant and we are so lucky to have 
one of them, uh, a federally listed one. We're studying this one now, mind you. I'll tell you about that in just a second. This is Pinguicula iantha on the left. Probably the rarest Pinguicula in Florida. This one is endemic to just about five counties in the central panhandle. The one in the middle here where I'm loving on is Pinguicula lutea. And on the right is Pinguicula planifolia, pretty easily distinguished from its other sympatric one that grows way down low, often inundated next to Pinguicula iantha, but planifolia often has purplish and reddish leaves, beautiful plants, awesome carnivorous plants. <clears throat> so I showed you a few of our listers, didn't get to all 20 of them, but we have at least 10 more listers in the area that we're watching out for. We're biting our fingernails, we're riveted, we can't wait for the return of, of some more. And you can see several here in the photographs. Other platantheras and also both members of the genus Parnassia here, grasses of Parnassus. They're not grasses, mind you, but anyway, they're called that in a common name. We're looking out for more, can't wait. You'll hear about it in our social media postings. Boy, do we love to make a first observation of another lister. And so, <clears throat> Moving right on into one of our other success metrics, biodiversity overall, y'all, is incredibly high on our preserve now. We have some, uh, you know, very rare animal species as well. The frogs here that you can see in the photograph, these are called the ornate chorus frog. This is the red color morph. And this species is believed to be declining all over its southeast range. But luckily and wonderfully, the Apalachicola National Forest considered its last remaining global stronghold. And boy, is it very strong on our preserve. It calls annually from um, one of our ephemeral wetlands. We have an ephemeral wetland on the property that we're managing with fire and brush removal. And uh, <clears throat> That's these butterflies aren't monarchs, but they're the closely related queen. I've seen them many times. We have so many milkweeds. I'm going to show you here in just a second. The gorgeous bug there is a hemipteran in the genus Triatoma, um, a really, really gorgeous, rare one. Okay. And this flower is from one of our wetlands that is Utricularia purpurea, uh, purple bladderwort. And so continuing on with, with how diverse the, the flowering plants are on our property. We have milkweeds, the yin yang. <laughs> the one in the middle here is, is Asclepius cinerea. I have never in my life seen such a plethora, a density and abundance of the species on any patch of earth ever until I walked our preserve two months after our May 20, 2023 burn. I stopped counting at 500 and on the estimation, we must have had between five and 10,000 plants present on our preserve. It was just unbelievable. And, and monarchs, you know, everywhere. The other species here, there's connivans on the left and, and lancelata on the right. We've got two other species present. Looking out for more, there are other possibilities in the future. We certainly have pitcher plants. We only have two species at the moment. There are two others that we're looking for that we could have, but uh, we're being patient. The two that you can see here are uh, Saracenia flava and Saracenia cetacina. And uh, we've got several varieties of Saracenia flava. Wow, the, the varieties of that one will just blow your mind. I think, you know, people who love pitcher plants love this species. It's just a, it's a gorgeous, it's the only pitcher plant species in Florida, to my knowledge, that is not either state or federally listed. Flava, that is. <clears throat> and we've got ice flowers on the property. <laughs> uh, I wish I could see a show of hands. I would, I would ask, who all have experienced ice flowers? Well, those of us from uh, points farther south in Florida may not have seen these very frequently unless you come up to the northern part of the state where we literally have a, a temperate continental climate. This morning, it was 22 degrees um, at the Coastal Plains Institute's office here where I work and live. And so 
Wow, it would have been a great morning for ice flowers, honestly. But ice flowers are these interesting structures. My dad, Bruce, has, has written uh, quite a bit about these things. And uh, they form, they are ice uh, formations that form at the base of several plant genera. Um, the ones I'm aware of are the genus Verbicina and Eupatorium. They're members of the aster family. But wow, what what neat, neat things they are. Of course, they're not living flowers, but they're beautiful nonetheless. I thought you'd like to have a look at them. <clears throat> and so moving on with success metrics, we can see what the, the dominant structure now of our of our canopy and our understory and our midstory is on the left. We see that we have a very, very open savanna. You're right. It's a very open savanna, not a forest at all. It still is slash pine, but our midstory now is primarily longleaf pine, and eventually, over time, the longleaf pine will overtake and outcompete the slash pines. Folks, if I didn't make this clear, the slash pines remaining on our preserve will not have many or any, honestly, uh, opportunities to breed at, or to, to reproduce themselves because they are, are in the presence now of a frequent natural fire regime. And the fire returns too frequently for the young slash pine who, who tried to, to set seed and tried to reproduce on this property but rather, they, they don't have enough time to grow tall enough to beat our frequent fire regime. Therefore, all of the young, uh, young slash pines that attempt, you know, to uh, to grow right underneath the adults aren't allowed to. But the longleaf pines do because they're the only ones that can survive frequent fires at at young body stages, small body stages. So that's pretty cool stuff there. Eventually. You know, we're either going to take the slash pines out or just let decades do its thing. On the right here, you can see that a great deal of our property is blanketed in a wonderfully, a luscious, diverse, herbaceous ground cover. You know, we, it wasn't easy getting where we're at, and there are absolutely some challenges to providing the kind of fire that we provide in perpetuity on the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve. You know, people generally hate fire and smoke. You know, um, it's often difficult to get a burn permit from our permitting agency, which is the Florida Forestry Service, because they're afraid um, during the May-June window because it's hot and potentially, you know, dry. And it, it, you know, you're worried about fires jumping the fire lanes and becoming liable uh, and hurting people. Nobody wants people to be hurt or none of us want structures to burn up. But we we have to stop being, in my opinion, overly fearful because fear manifests, OK, in our fire policies. And it makes it really hard to get a burn permit on on many of the ecological burn days. So we have to try to overcome fear. And we, you know, if I hope there's some Q&A here at the end. I've got some suggestions on how to do that. But, you know, it's the primary challenge. And I believe that education and action are the answers to the problem of overcoming fear. Um, you know, we have to also become activists and change fire policy, change the laws that govern when and how we can burn and uh, try not to succumb to our fear so much. <clears throat> well, we got all kinds of things going on now on our magnificent preserve. I'm really happy to share these with you. Uh, recently, about a year ago, we are the proud recipients of a three-year Florida plant conservation um, um, program grant. Um, it's, a, it's a joint money source opportunity from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services uh, jointly with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to supply private landowners with funding to manage and study and foster 
um, best management for any potential federally listed plant species that they have on their properties. And we are so lucky to have two, at least two that we know of. Maybe we'll, we have more that we're unaware of. Um, the two that we know of that we're so proud to receive this money to, to study and foster are Macbridea alba, which is called white birds in a nest. And look at those little birdies in the nest there. You can see this is a mint family plant, a delicious, a delightful um, species. It's Oh man, it's endemic to the central panhandle and it blooms profusely on our preserve. And on the right here, this is Pinguicula ionantha I alluded to earlier, but this one also is federally listed and our money is allowing us to map precisely where every individual and every bloom is um, with, the, with the desire, of course, to monitor in the future how our, how our two endangered species are doing. We hypothesize they're gonna do just fine because why? They live in the presence of their natural, historical, or at least an ecological burn regime that closely mimics the conditions that they are, are long adapted for. And they have so many opportunities now to bloom because fire cues them into doing so. <clears throat> um, as part of our FPCP grant, we want to become a transplant recipient site for other federal federally listed plant species that are in our area that our property is the correct habitat for and is very close to oh one I can think of and one that we're really really ate to acquire is called Harper's Beauty it's Harper Ocalis flava it's one of the rarest plants in the state and therefore in the world honestly this is a one county plant it is only from Liberty County Florida. It is a lovely little diminutive yellow in the Tophiliaceae that will just steal your heart. And to know that it is so, so damn rare, it just, you know, breaks my heart. But it also makes me very excited that we are thumbs up and permitted under our FPCP grant to receive some of these. We're going to work with Jeff Glichtenstein here really soon to acquire some of this species and uh, transplant or plant them on the ALP. Can't wait for that. You know, our field trips to this property are booming. People love the preserve. I love the preserve. I love to get people outdoors. It's a match made in heaven. So I hope to see many or all of, 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 of you all who are at this presentation today in the coming weeks. So it's April and October are prime but we can do it anytime, any group that reaches out to me, I hate saying no, um, I'll make my very best effort to get you out to the preserve, okay? We love science. Anyone who wants to do a scientific research project on the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve is welcome to reach out to us and make us a proposal. Yes, okay, we also do plenty, uh, allow for documentary and educational filming to occur on our property. After all, it is a showcase, we believe, for how to properly ecologically manage for the biodiversity and for restorative purposes of a southeastern coastal plain pine savanna. Some additional things that we're doing on the property is, you know, as good as it looks, we're not perfect. We're still moving toward perfection. It's going to take a few more decades to have all those slash pines out of there and, and our, our youngster lonely pines to be mature sized, right? It probably will take a century for that to happen. And, you know, we also have some invasive species as well of as well as some actually exotic ones like Rattlebox, a Japanese climbing firm, fern. We're trying to manually remove those things. I know it's a challenge. A lot of people use chemicals, but we're not really into chemicals. We're doing our best to just get out there with work crews and, and you know, TLC and having some good, good times and, and bonding and just literally yank them up if that's possible. <clears throat> you know, Really what we've learned, we've learned a great deal, but what is absolutely apparent, if you want 
to maintain or restore the biodiversity of a southeastern upland landscape, which was at some point back in history, uh, a pine savanna, you know, you know, 90 something percent of the landscape, if it was an upland, was very likely a pine savanna. If you want to foster that moving forward or restore a, a, a piece of earth in the southeast um, that needs some love and attention, the most important thing that you possibly can do is, is as rapidly as possible after you acquire the land is begin applying an ecological burn regime to that property. And don't take your foot off the pedal. Keep the pedal to the metal. Burn every two years on the average in the correct you know, ecological time window and you will have amazing results. Of course, you can do things to speed it up. You can cut, you can plant, you can remove encroachers. And I encourage us all to do that. Time is of the essence. We're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're in the midst of, of an ecological crisis on earth. And so if we do want to save something that's left, I, I am a supporter of speeding it up as, as much as possible. The future looks really bright, y'all, for the ALP. I'm just so excited about this property. It's one of the greatest things I've ever ever been associated with. And uh, we're just going to keep burning ecologically forever, as long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm the president of the Coastal Plains Institute. We're going to keep using the ALP for science and education, absolutely. And we'll expand if and when necessary. And very importantly, I, I want to see this, this preserve serve as a safe haven for locally imperiled species because there are a lot of them. And the reason there are a lot of them, y'all, is because the surrounding landowner <laughs> is not always able to ecologically burn. In fact, is very seldom able to ecologically burn. And you heard me say earlier that any burn regime other than a burn regime that mimics the natural historical wildfire regime of southeastern pine savannas is going to limit biodiversity and will favor or will will create declines in biodiversity okay and so much of the southeast coastal plain now is either altered in its fire regime from the natural or it is simply fire suppressed period and therefore we have so many imperiled species that are in need of fires to stimulate them to reproduce. That's the whole deal about fire. You know, hundreds of species of flowering plants that grow in the Lonely Pine ecosystem are adapted to a, to a certain fire regime. And they're adapted to, to either um, um, create a bloom because of the fire or to have an opportunity to reproduce at the correct time of year um, because the, the vegetative cover has been removed. It now becomes, because of the fire, it becomes a gigantic open free-for-all. And those plants that pop up and produce blooms as rapidly after a given burn with enough growing season left to produce, you know, uh, to produce uh, individuals were the ones that were favored over evolutionary time. That's one reason why the longleaf pine ecosystem is so biologically diverse. Uh, <clears throat> and, and this is very important too. I see the Apalachicola Lowlands Preserve as being a classroom for doing this on other inholdings inside of the Appalach or Apalachicola National Forest. I would love to continue to acquire more inholdings. There are dozens of private lands inside of the Apalachicola National Forest, and I am licking my chops and watching and trying to scheme and find ways to acquire more and more of those lands because under our management, we will absolutely, it is our mission to preserve biodiversity and therefore manage in a way that mimics mother nature. And, uh, you know, We'd like to create multiple ALPs out inside of the Apalachicola National Forest because we need safe havens for those imperiled species 
that we may well lose if we don't do a better job. And so with that, y'all, I want to say thank you so very much for this opportunity to present to you. And I am most delighted to shut up now and, and hopefully have lots of questions. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. That was fantastic. Um, uh, we have we have a few questions. Um, one is, you know, you, you really do uh, preach that message about fire and its natural um, cycle. What are your thoughts on how we can encourage other agencies to um, burn in that manner? I think that the tool of of education in the in the vast grassroots general public is going to have to turn into political pressure on our elected officials, as well as political pressure on our uh, fire governing organization or uh, agency, which is the Florida Forestry Service, and other political means to try to get fire policies to change, um, you know, and, you know, very noteworthy, we have to stop being so fearful about having smoke on the roadways. And that that's one of the first impediments. The agency often will not provide a burn permit for an aspiring burner on any given day, if weather conditions are, or wind conditions are such that they believe that smoke could end up on any given roadway in Florida. And it, it, it makes me grit my teeth when we're denied a permit um, in say May or June when the, when the permitting agency tells us that Florida road uh, state or county road, what is it out there? 379 near our preserve might get too much smoke on it. You know, on any given day, 10 or 15 cars pass on that road. And it's just, come on. I can almost understand trying to avoid a pileup in Orlando on I-4, of course. But, but to have that policy extend to very obscure roads, it's just a real impediment, you know, just uber, uber amounts of fear that manifest in our policy. We, the people have to pressure, you know, our political appointees and agencies to get policies to change, to relax up a little bit, to make it easier for landowners to provide burns period, but burns especially during the ecological window when the Florida Forestry Service believes frequently that A, it's either too hot and dry to burn, or B, it's too chaotic with swirling winds and we don't know where that smoke might go and it might just end up on any given road. And so with that, y'all, that's my best answer for for a, a short time frame here. And uh, it's, it's a tough one. It, this is, yeah, we're not just, dealing with this in the Southeast, we're dealing with it all over North America. <clears throat> Absolutely, I appreciate that answer and kind of just want to echo that um, as someone who's worked with the state agencies for a long time, the challenges that they face as well because the public doesn't support burning by and large. And we really do have to change that narrative within the public if we hope to change it in the policies. Um, great, thank you. Um, can you clarify the difference, if there is one, between pine savanna and a music flatwood? Just trying to understand that terminology better. Absolutely, great question. A pine savanna is a general ecological term applied to a a forest cover that has a very very open canopy, and there's got to be and I'm and I'm failing to remember what percent cover in the canopy uh, ab above which you have a forest with a with a denser than let's say fifty percent coverage in the canopy or less than fifty percent your trees 
produce you know a widely scattered canopy with less than 50 percent cover would be called a savanna so a savanna is a very very highly open plant community whose you know tallest trees tallest members of the community the overstory are very widely scattered that's what a savanna is and a pine savanna of course is just a savanna that's composed of of pine trees as the dominant species of plant that that grow the tallest a mesic flatwoods is also an e ecological term given to uh, the soil types that are common in the extreme southeast gulf coastal plain and parts of the eastern Atlantic uh, coastal plain too. Um, it, just as the word as as the word suggests, the topography is extremely flat, and that's because we're on the coastal plain. And very frequently um, throughout the Pleistocene, um, or at least several times during that time, sea level has stood, you know, higher than it is today, and has covered much of what we call the coastal plain now and um <clears throat> it's 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 um far away from the appalachian mountains and erosion and and, and wave action has flattened the coastal plain over millions of years and so a being flat b the the soils often are composed of sands coarse sands on top but not too far down underneath on a on a flatwoods you have a much more fine grain soil, so much so that it's densely compact like clay. It is clay, as a, as a matter of fact, and clay is an impermeable layer to water. And so what you have on a board flat terrain in, a, in this coastal plain environment that we live in that has a lot of annual rainfall, that has a, 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 a geological confining layer a compact clay layer underneath the sands on top, what you have are moist soils in, in lots of the southeast. Okay. The, the deeper your sand gets and the farther below your clay layer, well, the higher and drier and the more xeric. Xeric means dry. Mesic means lower and moist. Think of mesic equaling moist. And there's the term that, that goes even lower or moisture yet, and that's called hydric. So mesic flatwoods is a moist, flat area that historically contained a longleaf pine, primarily longleaf pine, savanna on it. <laughs> that's a great explanation, thank you. Um, we're right at three o'clock, so I do wanna thank everybody who's joined us today. Um, we have two questions that I think will be pretty quick and I'm just gonna combo them and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, the first one is, do you currently have any um, other properties in the works for a new um, uh, preserve? And then does your organization offer consultations or do you have any recommendations for consult for who could do that for landowners looking to restore their properties back to native biodiversity? I'm going to try to be as quick, quick as I can. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, and please, uh, whoever, I can't see who asked that question, please feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, whatever, call me and be happy to talk to you more about that. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you again so much, for, Ryan, for that wonderful presentation <laughs> and everyone who joined us today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Thank you so very much. I really enjoyed it. Hope to see y'all out in the woods or at the preserve sometime. Absolutely. <laughs>